Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Single Molecule Proteomics Using Protein Identification by Short Epitope Mapping. I am Antonina Salcedo of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Nautilus Biotechnology. To learn more, please visit nautilus.bio. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Parag Malik, Founder and Chief Scientist at Nautilus Biotechnology. Dr. Malik, you may now begin your presentation. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to share with you some of the foundations of Nautilus's platform. We shared some of this new data at Hoopo very recently, and I'm excited to share with, with you today. Just to set the foundation, it's important to think about the landscape of proteomics. We understand that proteins are the key drivers of biology and that there are a number of challenges in the field, looking at protein-protein interactions, discovering better biomarkers, digging into mechanisms of signaling, and, and ultimately finding the next set of drug targets. Despite this tremendous importance of the field, when we look out at the landscape of proteomics, we recognize that there is a massive gulf between the progress that is made, the influence and penetrance of genomics versus proteomics. And we can see this just in the publication landscape between the two over the past 20 years. This is despite our ongoing knowledge and increasing awareness that the genome and transcriptome and proteome aren't particularly well correlated. Um, it's shown in the center here is one of the earliest proteogenomic papers from uh, Lee Hood and Rudy Abersold looking at yeast. And I don't know if you all can see the amazingly strong correlation between the transcriptome and proteome. This was then replicated more recently in work by Bing Zheng's group and the CPTAC, again, looking across hundreds of tumor specimens and really finding no significant correlation between the transcriptome and the proteome. And this makes sense biologically. You have an entirely novel length scale, an entirely novel regulatory scale. It would be terrifically wasteful for the cell to have the transcriptome and the proteome perfectly correlated. Additionally, we have tremendous variation in both transcription rates, transcript degradation rates, translation rates, and protein degradation rates that would make it incredibly improbable for the transome and the proteome to be perfectly correlated. As a preamble, it's just important to recognize that the different regulatory scales cooperate to drive biology. Now, one of the challenges that proteomics has faced is that it is incredibly hard to measure the proteome. The main reasons are, are really fourfold. First off, proteins span an incredibly wide dynamic range. Within cells, you have proteins like transcription factors that may be present in a handful of copies per cell, as well as cytoskeletal proteins and ribosomal proteins that may be present in, in millions of copies per cell. Additionally, there's no PCR for proteins. Unlike the genome, where we can take advantage of polymerases to copy the genome and transcriptome, uh, that isn't possible for proteins. If you only have one molecule of a protein, that's all you have. You need a technique that is sensitive enough to measure a single molecule. Among the other principal challenges is that proteins themselves are biophysically extremely diverse, unlike the genome and transcriptome that are, are biophysically very similar to each other. The, every single protein is its own unique snowflake with a range of charges and hydrophobicities and sizes, and, uh, making interrogation very difficult. And then compounding that, proteins themselves are modified with a series of glycosylations and phosphorylations, methylations, generating proteiforms such that each individual molecule uh, may have 
a diversity of proteiforms it inhabits. If we look at the landscape today, and we ask the question, what are we able to look at with existing technologies? Though incredibly powerful, there remain a huge set of proteins that are not routinely queryable within a standard assay. And then if one shifts the landscape to look at proteiforms, we really don't have tools available to dive deeply into the proteiform landscape. Despite how incredibly powerful today's tools are, it's natural to take a step back and say, right, well, what if we were starting over, if we were to start over from scratch, what would we want our proteomics platform to be able to do? And so we can write down a list of key criteria, and I'm always curious to hear what are, what are all of your key criteria in developing an entirely novel platform. When Nautilus sat down, these were the criteria we came up with. First, we wanted a platform that was comprehensive, something that could measure substantively all of the proteins in a sample. It, of course, needs to be sensitive, measuring those very rare molecules. But at the same time, needing to have a wide dynamic range. As we commented on earlier, the scale of the proteome is vast. And so we need a technique that is able to measure across that entire range. Any scientific analytic technique, of course, needs to be reproducible and robust. That gives the path towards clinic. Um, ultimately, we have a very large number of samples, particularly as we start thinking about temporal studies and large cohort studies. And so a rapid runtime is critical. And then I'll just mention quickly, we want a platform that's really easy to use, something that is accessible to any lab, any biologist so that the proteome is available to everybody. Taking these criteria, Nautilus decided to, to move in the direction of a single molecule intact protein measurement platform. And there are a couple of reasons that this is valuable. First, a single molecule counter is definitionally the most sensitive you can be, measuring individual molecules. But also, at the single molecule level, the challenge of protein quantification fundamentally changes. If I can identify each individual molecule, I get my quantification for free by simply counting up all of those identifications. So at the single molecule level, identification becomes quantification. One of the major reasons why we focused on looking at intact proteins on the Nautilus platform is because of the potential for an increased dynamic range at a comparable throughput. Digesting each protein into potentially hundreds of triptych peptides uh, requires a larger number of measurements in order to cover a similar dynamic range. Additionally, the data interpretation in the protein assembly problem is complicated. Lastly, by not digesting the proteins, it becomes possible to measure proteiforms, to say, oh, this particular molecule has three phosphorylations at these different positions, some information that's lost when you digest the protein. Now, there are some substantial challenges in building a single molecule-based protein analysis platform. First, how do you guarantee that you're actually looking at single molecules? Second, one needs to have a technique that is actually sensitive enough to measure each individual molecule. And then lastly, it needs to not only be a sensitive technique, it also needs to be incredibly fast so that you can measure a large number of molecules to achieve the dynamic range necessary to profile the entirety of the protein. The Nautilus approach really has two key foundational tenets. The first is a sample preparation method that enables single molecule intact protein deposition onto a nanopatterned array. The second is an iterative affinity reagent binding um, platform that feeds machine learning. Digging into that, uh, that platform a little bit more, it's reliant upon three sub pieces. First, a set of proprietary multi-affinity probes, 
um, special affinity reagent reagents, um, an instrument that is able to iteratively interrogate the same sample immobilized on the chip over and over and over again, and a machine learning piece that is able to take that information and convert it into protein identities and quantities and proteoforms. We're going to walk through each of the different pieces of the platform in the coming few minutes, starting off with sample preparation and single molecule deposition. The way that many people address this challenge of single molecule protein deposition is with a technique known as limiting dilution, where they take their sample and spread it out uh, at very low concentration over a very large surface. This approach, though, though effective, um, leads to the vast majority of your space being empty, 90% plus of a chip area being empty. Additionally, this loading is what's known as Poisson loading, which means that 50% of the optically resolvable areas um, contain multiple molecules. Um, so 25% contain two, 12% contain three, and on and on and on. So it's challenging to guarantee individual molecules. Additionally, for efficiency, you're wasting a lot of imaging time with empty space. This point of measuring a very large number of molecules is critical. That scale is important in capturing the proteome. To look at this, one can take uh, a snapshot of the distribution of protein abundances within a cell, uh, as shown here on the left. Um, and this is taken from uh, existing estimates of proteome abundance distributions. And deposit in those uh, and simulate the deposition of those proteins onto a chip and ask how well are, is one able to cover the entirety of this distribution um, as a function of the number of molecules that you measure. And what you're looking at here on the right is exactly that. So each one of these bars represents the protein deposition as a function of the number of landing pads available. The width of each bar corresponds to, at a given concentration amount, how much of that, uh, how much of, how many of the proteins at that concentration band were able to be successfully deposited. And one can see that as one approaches uh, 10 to the eight, 10 to the nine, 10 to the 10 landing pads per chip, um, one is able to cover substantively all of the proteome across an incredibly wide dynamic range um, for cell materials, this uh, a chip with approximately 10 billion landing pads is able to cover over nine orders of magnitude in dynamic range. Uh, in, in blood, this ends up being about 11 and a half orders of magnitude. So measuring a large number of molecules is critical uh, and is the major reason for our significant investment in a single molecule protein deposition um, approach moving beyond limiting dilution. Now, the way that most people have attempted to, uh, to bridge super Poisson deposition is through creating landing pads that are really small um, so that you have stair hindrance between molecules and no molecules can land on the same uh, location. The team at Nautilus came up with a really clever approach. Um, it's often very challenging to fabricate chips that have very small feature sizes. So instead of making landing pads that are very small, the team at Nautilus instead decided to make the proteins big. And the way that they do this is through using an intermediate scaffold molecule, um, which is shown here. This scaffold uh, made out of DNA is quite large on the order of hundreds of nanometers. Um, but this nanoparticle is very unique. Unlike traditional nanoparticles of this size that may have hundreds of thousands of conjugation sites, this particular nanoparticle has exactly one. Um, and what's shown here is the general workflow where we would start with our nanoparticle scaffolds, shown here in an AFM image, um, conjugate them to a protein, um, and each scaffold can hold exactly one protein. We then deposit these scaffolds onto our nanofabricated array, and each landing pad can hold exactly one scaffold. So because we have one scaffold per landing pad, one protein per scaffold, mixing them together auto-assembles a hyperdense single molecule protein array. 
just to show in a little bit more detail what the sample prep workflow looks like, it's again, our goal was to make it as simple as possible. Um, it broadly looks like a traditional mass spectrometry based proteomics workflow, where we start with a sample of interest, extract the proteins from, from it, label them with a click reagent, um, in this case, uh, an NHS methyl tetrazine. We then mix those with the nanoparticle scaffold that has the tricyclooctane, the other half of the click reagent, which creates scaffold protein conjugates, and then deposit them on the chip. To validate that we were, in fact, generating a single molecule protein array, one can do an experiment where one admixes different colors of scaffold protein conjugates together um, and deposits them on the chip. And uh, zooming in, what you're looking at now is uh, a chip in which we've deposited two different colors of scaffolds. And what you can see uh, is that there are very few instances where there are multiple colors at the same site. Um, so if you had one, just one that was green, it would be a green. If you had just one that was purple, it would be purple. If you had a green and a purple co-localized, it would be white. And so in general, you can see uh, an occasional white, but dominantly a field of purple and green uh, in a control um, uh, using slightly different scaffolds, you end up with a field of white. Um, and so in general, we anticipate extremely high occupancy of these chips um, and extremely low co-localization. For additional detail, we recommend checking out our uh, our preprint in bioarchive. Um, just to show a little bit more uh, detail, in general, um, the reactions are completed very quickly within a matter of hours. Um, and then the chips themselves uh, are able to contain billions of landing pads per chip. What you're looking at here is a very small section of a chip. Um, each chip contains approximately 10,000 of these sections. Each one of, as we zoom in, you can see each of the individual protein molecules on the chip. Um, and so this area alone contains over um, 100,000 uh, protein molecules. Um, and as I mentioned before, you'll notice that it is, it is highly complete. And so in general, we anticipate occupancies in the high 90 percent. Hopefully you now have uh, a better understanding of how the single molecule deposition aspect of the platform works. And we'll transition to diving into the second aspect of the platform, which is the iterative measurement. Under the, the, at the heart of the platform, inside the instrument, is an integrated fluidics and imaging system, wherein each, at each iteration, probes are incubated, allowed to be rinsed, and then imaged. We then wash them off, and that consists of one cycle. The imaging is done with fluorescence. Um, we use uh, fluorescently labeled affinity reagents for this. And in each cycle, you will uh, incubate, rinse, image, wash, and do this over and over and over again. And because each molecule is fully immobilized, it can be repeatedly interrogated, building up increasingly more information about each molecule cycle after cycle after cycle. One of the really unique aspects of the platform is that even though it is a single molecule measurement platform, it is not a single fluorophore measurement platform. And that's important because that is a key part of how we're able to image as quickly as we are to, again, measure a large number of molecules. In fact, we attach our affinity reagents to another special type of nanoparticle uh, which contains both multiple affinity reagents, probes, as well as uh, as many, many fluorophores. So these nanoparticles are very bright, allowing for a rapid um, imaging time. And these nanoparticle labels are compatible with either off-the-shelf targeted antibodies or the novel multi-affinity probes that we've been building that target short amino acid sequences. The, uh, to test that the proteins remained probable and uh, stayed attached to the chip, we can do multi 
cycle experiments. Um, this is showing one. We'll show another one later in the presentation, um, showing that we have very negligible protein loss. The proteins stay very well attached to the chip. So that's like really the core of the platform. But one of the key questions we need to answer is, how do we identify individual molecules? How do we determine which molecule is which? They're scattered randomly throughout the array. And that's really the, the, the second part um, that relies upon our proprietary multi-affinity probes and our machine learning to identify each individual molecule in a technique we call PRISM. Um, to learn more, uh, recommend checking out the, the BioArchive preprint. The heart of the platform relies upon a special series of affinity reagents that instead of targeting whole proteins, target very short epitopes within those proteins, typically three to four amino acids long. And so what we're going to do is we're going to probe iteratively with each of these molecules, building up a profile at any individual molecule that says that you bound to probe one, two, six, et cetera, and then take that information and ask what protein is compatible with that pattern of binding. We then determine on a per molecule basis which protein is present and then derive our quantification by counting up all of those identifications. In a way, this approach is, is most analogous to a massively parallel machine learning version of the game Guess Who. One, at one particular location on the array, one way one could figure out the identity is by using tens of thousands of specific affinity reagent probes, essentially asking the question, are you Maria? Are you Robert? Are you Charles? Are you George? But that would be, that would re require tens of thousands of perfect affinity reagents. It would also be extremely time consuming. So in Guess Who, what we do instead is we ask much less specific questions. We ask, are you wearing a hat? Are you bald? Are you wearing a mustache? And while these questions themselves are much more general and much less specific, one can arrive at the right answer shockingly efficiently through asking a series of less specific questions. Um, to dig into this in a little more detail, one can look at, again, one particular molecule, perhaps EGFR, and observe a binding pattern of a series of short epitopes. One then uh, takes that information and, as I mentioned before, looks across the proteome to say what protein could be compatible with this pattern of epitopes and derive a probabilistic interpretation thereof. So as you can see below, uh, for a series of different proteins, if we ask the question, what protein is compatible with this series of bindings? Um, even though each probe on its own is not particularly protein specific, the combination of all of them together is shockingly specific, um, differentiating across many proteins. Um, we can observe this in a simulation shown here, where we're looking at one protein uh, and looking at many, many touches, probes landing on that protein. And you can see early on, it is unclear what this protein is. There are many possibilities, but once we get to about 10 or 15 touches, it becomes vanishingly improbable that the protein is anything other than the correct answer. One of the unique aspects of a single molecule binding platform is that each individual molecule may be probed. Uh, there, there is stochasticity. There are probes that, uh, that could theoretically bind that won't, but, PRISM is incredibly tolerant to this diversity of probe bindings. Um, and that's one of the really unique and special aspects. And why this is in part a machine learning problem is to take into account all of the stochasticity, the true, true positive binding, the false negative binding, false positive binding, in order to infer the identity of each protein molecule at each location. One of the common questions is how many cycles how many probings are required in order to deconvolve substantially all of the proteome? Recall that if we were to do this with specific affinity reagents, this would typically be on the order of tens of thousands of reagents. But by using our proprietary multi-affinity probes, we instead are potentially able to deconvolve substantively all of the proteome in a small number of hundreds of cycles. 
somewhere between two and 300 cycles. Once each protein has been identified, as I mentioned, uh, the, we look at the entire workflow. We start with our collection of our imaging data, our multi-cycle imaging data, take that, boil it down to a coordinate binding matrix, which essentially says at this given coordinate, we had this pattern of binding. We had binding from probes two and three and 85 and 92. Um, we then infer on a per molecule basis, which protein was present and then roll that up together um, by counting up all of those identifications to get our quantification. Hopefully this has given you a bit of a foundation to understand the, the underpinnings of the method. One of the questions that often arises is, well, how does one build these proprietary multi-affinity probes? Um, or more skeptically, can these things actually exist? Um, we have a number of different approaches that we've taken. This is one of them, uh, really reliant upon phage display. We start with a large library, pan for uh, antibodies that recognize short epitopes, um, select uh, and build antibodies um, um, from those selections. And then shown here on the right are a few examples of affinity reagents that we've built, um, really looking at their EC50s. And so, uh, both testing for on-target binding and off-target binding. And what you can see, for instance, here is a probe um, recognizing the motif YWL. The YWL um, has incredibly strong binding, um, low tens of picomolar binding um, to its intended target and negligible binding to an off-target. Um, this is really the first step is building a, a set of incredibly uh, efficient short epitope multi-affinity probes. The second step is characterizing and validating that not only do they bind to their target of interest, but what else do they bind to? We know that all affinity reagents have, a, have some cross-reactivity. So one of our next key steps is to actually examine that. And so we do a lot of work in characterizing these probes, um, looking across peptide arrays, doing extensive epitope mapping, and one of our often conclusions is that any given probe will bind to a neighborhood, typically of biosimilars, around uh, its selected target. One of the other common questions is, is there a special, magical, perfect set of targets that this works for uh, and works better for? Or can it be nearly any arbitrary collection of of two to 300 epitope targets. And in looking at that question, what you can see is if we look at the most optimal set of targets, um, it is able to efficiently cover the vast majority of the proteome in approximately two to 300 probes and cycles. Um, if we look instead at a random collection of probes and targets, um, while they don't perform quite as well, the delta is relatively small, particularly as one gets out to larger numbers of cycles. So really, um, the PRISM method is incredibly tolerant to false positives and false negatives. It is not reliant upon a singular perfect set of affinity reagents um, and is, uh, is able to, to account for a lot of experimental noise. To put PRISM into practice, um, one of the really exciting new pieces of, of data that I have to share with you today is, is from a larger experiment where performed uh, up to 70 cycles of, of imaging um, across dozens of multi-affinity probes, including some negative controls. Um, we deposited a series of proteins, um, uh, protein scaffold conjugates onto our chips, um, and then incubated uh, imaged, removed, over and over and over and over again. And as shown previously, um, the proteins are retained extremely well uh, throughout the entire experiment. Um, and then one of the key questions is, what does decoding look like in practice? Um, and so this is an example of one particular molecule really digging in and asking the question, all right, what is our confidence in this particular protein versus any other protein in the database? And what you can see here is with between model protein one and model protein two, uh, and in the middle is when we have an observed binding event. 
So um, potentially, we had a series of different target epitopes, um, some of which are shown here. Um, and you can see, for instance, a binding here, um, which is giving us some additional confidence that this particular molecule is model protein 1, this epitope not being present in model protein 2. Um, continuing along, we have another series of, of touches on this protein, binding events, that again boost our confidence in this being model protein 1 instead of model protein 2. You'll notice that this particular binding event, this epitope, was present in both model protein 1 and model protein 2. So we don't get any decoding or uh, probabilistic boost from that binding event in terms of differentiating these particular two proteins. Um, as we continue along, we get increasing binding events to this target uh, and ultimately end up more than 10,000 times it is more than 10,000 times more likely that the protein present at this location is model protein 1 versus model protein 2. Um, and we look at this across an entire database of different proteins. Um, looking across a sample, we also do a number of, of computational analyses to look at false discovery rate, to set different false discovery rate thresholds. These involve shuffling of the database, shuffling of the probe binding, as well as uh, doing leave one out analyses, et cetera, on binding. Uh, and one can see across a particular sample um, incredibly high counts for model protein one um, and very low false discovery rates, very low counts um, for any other, uh, other protein. So the shuffling of the data, the FDR estimation, um, really helps us validate that the identifications are not an artifact of random binding. So, uh, what we've focused on so far today has really been Nautilus's approach for broad cell decoding, I'm really looking to measure uh, the width and breadth of the proteome. The platform can also be used in, in a targeted manner to examine proteoforms. Um, in this, in, when used in this manner, the fundamentals of the platform remain the same. We are still immobilizing individual protein molecules on the platform. We're still probing them iteratively with a series of affinity reagents. But instead of using our uh, our multi-affinity probes targeting short epitopes, we now can use probes targeting uh, individual post-translational modification sites or specific targeted proteins. And this allows us to build up a profile of each individual molecule, again, um, at a level of detail that allows one to look at proteoforms. Proteoforms, of course, are critical drivers of phenotype. We recognize that after, uh, after coming from the genome, going through alternative splicing in the, trans in the transcriptome, we already end up with a wide variety of protein isoforms. Each one of these isoforms can then be modified with a series of possible post-translational modifications, methylations, phosphorylations, etc., that lead to a potentially millions of different proteoforms. An intact protein approach is necessary because uh, of samples like this one. So consider for a moment if you had a sample like this where you had one molecule that was triply phosphorylated at different sites and then two molecules that were unmodified. This sample would look identical uh, when digested to the sample on the right where we had three molecules, each of which were modified at a different loci. Uh, even though biologically, biochemically, these are very different samples that might behave very differently and have radically different uh, um, cellular impact. For targeted proteoform analysis, as I mentioned before, we start by immobilizing our proteins. We'll then probe with a targeted probe, such as uh, for EGFR shown in this instance, to localize where all the EGFRs are, and then come in with a position-specific probe that allows us to say, oh, you have a modification at this loci. Wipe it off, come in again with a, another probe that binds to a different loci. And again, build up a pattern that says, oh, this particular mo molecule has modifications at those sites. Do this again, wipe off, and over time, again, building up more and more and more information. 
on a per molecule basis. And with, uh, with as few as six cycles, one is able to potentially elaborate 32 distinct proteoforms. One study that we've been excited to work with our partners at Genentech on has been looking at the protein tau, uh, which is, of course, a critical protein involved in neurodegenerative diseases. Um, tau has a number of different phosphorylations. It also has a variety of different isoforms. And so in this experiment, we first immobilize our proteins, um, determine where the tau molecules are, probe with different phosphor anti-phosphorylation sites, motifs, to build up, again, on a molecule-by-molecule -molecule basis, um, information about what isoform is present at a given location and what possible modifications are present. And uh, in one experiment, um, to validate the approach, um, we took a series of samples of different, uh, different isoforms and proteoform mix, uh, proteoforms, put them into the platform and asked, all right, are we able to determine first the right proteoform within that sample? Next, we mix them together to ask, can we quantitatively determine um, how much of each proteoform is present in a complex mixture containing an admixture of different proteoforms? Something that we believe is incredibly challenging to do with any other method. And really, it's the unique capability of the platform to iteratively probe each molecule over and over and over again in as an intact protein that allows us to dig into the molecular heterogeneity at this level of detail, studying proteoforms. Just to sum up, the Nautilus proteome analysis platform is really, has really been designed to deliver sensitivity at scale. Platform, coming back to our key aspirational goals in building the platform, has been designed to be extremely comprehensive, ultimately measuring substantively all of the proteome. Um, it is a quantitative digital readout, um, the sample preparation being relatively straightforward, and the, uh, the iterative probing being very robust, um, aiming towards an incredibly reproducible method. We've talked about as a single molecule counter, it is definitionally incredibly sensitive, um, potentially able to measure low abundance proteins. Um, the platform has been designed to be incredibly high throughput, measuring billions of molecules um, within about a day. And again, one of our key criteria was, was ease of use, wanting something that was simple, that um, was accessible to the broader biological community. I'll just close by mentioning that we recently launched the Single Molecule Proteomics First Access Challenge. Uh, it's a really exciting opportunity deadline in mid-February. Um, please do submit your applications. Um, winners of the application will analyze 12 of your samples using the Nautilus Proteomics Analysis Platform, provide you with a summary report, and, and also support travel expenses to present, uh, present your work. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, thank you all very much again for your attention today. And I'm looking forward to, to taking questions. Thank you, Dr. Malik, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Now let's get started. Our first question um, has a few questions within it. It says, great presentation. Thank you for sharing this wonderful study. My cur my cur queries, sorry, are, is it only quantitative tests, um, says only proteins are present or no? Can this technology be used for quantitative analytical assay, such as preparing cal calibration, measuring proteins uh, quantitatively? If quantitative, do you know the sensitivity of this technology? Super. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, the, the, the assay is absolutely quantitative. Um, there are really What's really special about it being a single molecule based technique is that while on a per molecule basis, you are making an identification, you're making a detection, but then quantitation comes from summing up all of those identifications. 
literally counting. So if I make 100 counts of a given protein, I sum that up and I say I had 100 molecules present on the chip. Um, and so uh, it absolutely can be used uh, quantitatively. Um, one can potentially think about um, adding additional calibration standards um, as well on top of that. But definitionally, as a single molecule counter, uh, it is um, quantitative. And from a sensitivity perspective, that there is no transform to brightness or intensity. Uh, it, and so um, theoretically, practically, um, you, uh, a single molecule counter is definitionally the most sensitive kind of measurement that one can make. Now, that does need to be caveated with factors like nonspecific binding and false positive rates and low detection events. Um, so the, the absolute limit of quantitation, while theoretically single, a single molecule amongst a field of billions um, is, uh, is, is something that we're still working through to, to provide a, a really detailed um, uh, titration series data for, for everyone. Um, Thank you for that. Um, another question here, what are the factors to consider for false identification and quantitation? So that's a, that's a really important question and something we think about a lot. Um, when we think about, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll really focus on the false identification part because that rolls up directly into quantitation, as I mentioned before. Um, so when we think about false identification, the way we think about it is very similar to mass spectrometry-based proteomics techniques. What's the likelihood that a given identification would be incorrect? And what are the factors that drive that? Um, one, some false positive rate associated with binding events that uh, are not, um, that, are, that are spurious. Um, so you have the likelihood of false positive binding events. You have given a set of binding events, what, how close is the next most probable protein? Now, in general, um, as you start to get a larger number of binding events, the next closest protein tends to be quite far away. Um, but one can ask the question, if I had one less binding event or two less binding events, um, am I still confident that it is this particular protein? Um, you can also shuffle around the binding events uh, and, and examine how that might change um, what your potential protein is. And so in the same way that we can do target decoy in mass spectrometry, uh, we also can do a similar target decoy approach um, with this method. So we actually calculate multiple um, uh, false discovery rates um, to account for uh, variation in protein database, variation in binding events, um, variation in uh, in false positive binding rates, et cetera, to build our confidence um, in any given identification and to provide references for false identification rates. Um, and then that directly translates to quantitation um, because as, as your false identification rate um, is loosened, there will be some impact on your quantitation because your counts are gonna change subtly. Thank you. Our next question. Um, what are the databases used for protein reference um, and determination? And is this a species agnostic method? Yeah, so, um, so the method is sequence uh, is species agnostic um, because the probes that we use target very short epitopes, three to four amino acids long. Um, the the uh, species of origin of the sample doesn't matter. These are not organism specific probes in any way. Um, Consequently, the database that we use for human studies is typically a uniprot uh, database, but um, any, any reference proteome database um, can be used. So for instance, if one were studying plants, one could use a plant reference. Uh, um, if one were studying, studying uh, translational systems, mice, et cetera, yeast, um, all of those are, are quite, uh, quite possible. Great, thank you. We have some great questions coming in. Um, another question, are there limitations to the sample types that could be used with the platform? A great question. Um, in, initially, with the platform, um, we are focusing on, on human cell lysates as our, as our 
initial uh, initial foray, expanding from there into serum and plasma. Um, there are a couple particular types of samples that may be more challenging. Um, so, uh, for instance, FFPE tissues, where the proteins are extremely cross-linked, um, we don't as yet, uh, we haven't as yet worked through what might be required to get from cross-linked proteins to single protein molecules. Um, a few other sample types that may potentially be challenging are, uh, are um, sample types composed exclusively of very short peptides, such as the immunopeptidome. Um, and a third sample type that may be challenging are things like the metaproteome. Um, going back to our prior question, when studying the metaproteome, we don't have a good reference protein database to, uh, to compare to. Um, but outside of that, uh, we feel like it is a broadly applicable um, uh, approach. Great, thank you. Um, cool. Another question, how long does it take to analyze the data? Um, so that's a, that's a um, when we think about data analysis, there are multiple phases of data analysis. There's the, the very first uh, phase where you're just taking the image data and, and turning it into uh, coordinate binding matrices and then getting from there to identifications. And that, that effective time is on par with experimental time. Um, the next phase, I would say, is actually where the vast majority of the data analysis time is spent, which is understanding the biology and I don't have a great answer for you there because it really depends on the question that's being asked. And um, uh, as with any um, high throughput data modality, um, those, those analyses can be quite complex. We're, we're working actively to try and simplify that as well for our customers, um, but that there's a lot of fun to be had in diving into the quantitative aspects of the data and how, how um, it connects to other data that you may have as well. Thank you. We have time for just a few more. Um, our next question here is, how do you remove the high affinity antibodies after each cycle? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, oftentimes, when we think about the assay, like, how do we, we, we're working really hard to build affinity reagents that are very tight binders, but how do we get rid of them? Um, the, fortunately, our proteins are immobilized uh, glued down to the surface. And so because they're glued down, uh, you can be extremely harsh in your removal buffers. Um, we often use things like 10% SDS uh, as a very uh, as a removal that is non-protein damaging. It's not chemically active. It's not going to um, break bonds um, or damage the proteins, um, but it'll do a really good job of a lot of of allowing the antibodies to unbind and, and get washed away. Thank you. And we will end with this one. What are the major applications of the platform? That's a really fun question. And I would flip it back to all of you. I'm really curious, now that you understand a little bit more about the platform, what do you want to do with it? Um, from, uh, from my perspective as a member of the field for many years, there, there are a couple areas that I'm really excited about, but every time I talk to somebody, um, they often come and say, hey, I'd love to do this, I'd love to do that. Um, so I'd, off the cuff, I'd say the, the earliest applications are likely um, in both the therapeutic space and the, and the diagnostic space. On the therapeutic space, uh, finding uh, novel targets, um, proteins that are on the cell surface of a disease tissue um, and not prevalent on, um, on associated healthy control tissues, um, really that target discovery aspect downstream from that, the mechanism of action and toxicity studies, understanding with a lead compound, um, if I treat a cell population, what's the network of coordinated consequences there? Um, and then uh, on the diagnostic side, of course, finding those novel biomarkers that differentiate either disease populations from healthy populations or uh, responders from non-responders, um, as well as characterize drug activity. Hey, thank you, Dr. Malik. Um, do you have any final comments for our audience? Hey, I'll just thank you so much for, for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, if you have other follow-up questions, please do just shoot us a note. We're really happy to, to chat with you.
Thank you again, Dr. Malik, for your time today and your important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Nautilus, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Any questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with any one of your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.